Welcome to part 16 in this series on Prodigal Israel. In this episode, I want to touch on this all-important subject of the New World Order. Now, I don't want to mislead you. I'm not going to be talking about the Illuminati or any conspiracy theories. What I'm really wanting to get at is the government that Jesus has already begun to establish in preparation for the kingdom that is to come. When you look at the kingdoms of this world throughout history, there are many nations that have been conquered with a mighty army, and the conquerors have then taken over and they've ruled that particular country. But in our present time, the democratic system in many of the countries is in, is in operation. But even that system is fraught with so many problems because it is usually brought about by false promises, political maneuvering, bribery and corruption. And as one looks at the result of man's leadership, it is clear that every country right throughout history is being mismanaged. And even the whole creation, this world, is being mismanaged by the people that are running it. But God's system of developing a ruling nation and a government to control the world as he intended with Adam and Eve right from the very beginning is done in a totally different way. And that's really what I'm wanting to look at in this episode. Just by way of illustration, there is a computer game where you can choose your own soccer team and then you can choose the best players and then play the game against other teams on the computer. And if you were to choose, for instance, uh, Real Madrid or one of the better teams, Barcelona, Man United, Netherlands or, the, or Germany, and then put into that team the very best players in the world, your chances of losing are very slim and your chances of victory are obviously very great. But if on the other hand you were to choose a team that is notoriously bad like Bafana Bafana and you were to go with those players to the World Cup and actually win the World Cup, you would prove beyond any shadow of doubt that you're the best coach in the world. Now I'm using that just as an illustration because God in the way he is going about preparing the ruling nation and the people that are to rule the world, he is not choosing the best and the most powerful. He's actually choosing the worst. And the reason he has told us in scripture is so that human beings can't boast. And this whole principle of our need to be completely dependent upon God is absolutely vital to the smooth running of God's government and the new world order. It is vital that we learn that because that's what Adam and Eve chose not to learn. When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was so that they might have a knowledge that made them independent from God. And God had told them that they would have dominion over the creation, but now they were going to do it their way. And so it's so important to God that those who rule and reign are working closely with him and recognize their total dependency upon the Lord. So let's just look at the scriptures that tell us that very clearly. So here are the reasons that the Lord gives for choosing Israel. He says, The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath, he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So that's the reason God has chosen them, not because they were great, but rather because they were fewest in number. Then he goes on to, to speak about their character and he says, understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord God is giving you this good land to possess, leading them into the promised land. For you are a stiff necked people, very stubborn, very difficult to work with. I have seen this people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff necked people. Isaiah then says, For I knew how stubborn you were, the sinews of your neck were iron, 
your forehead was bronze. So they are a difficult people, but God was wanting the nations to know that he was not choosing the best of the world, but rather the most difficult of the world to raise them up because he wants us to understand the need to be dependent upon him. So let's now look at just some of the details of Israel just very quickly to see how that the facts corroborate what God has said. So here is a map of Israel and the lighter color is the whole of Israel. It is only 22,145 square kilometers in size, a very small country. And if you were to compare it with the Kruger National Park in South Africa, it is a similar size. Kruger Park is 19,485 square kilometers. So Israel is obviously very, very small. And yet the Lord is raising it up to be the ruling nation of the whole world. The Jewish population of Israel at the moment is approximately 9 million people. But the whole total Jewish population of the world is approximately 18 million. So if you compare that with the seven odd billion people in the world it is really a tiny minority and that's exactly what the lord was saying i didn't choose you because you were more numerous than the other nations but rather because you were fewest so he's using this tiny nation in this tiny piece of land to raise them up to conquer the world but obviously they're going to need their king the lord jesus to do that unfortunately just like adam and eve Israel chose to go it alone independently and so king after king rose and fell but at the end of the Old Testament the whole nation of Israel was in dire straits. They had mismanaged everything and although they were God's chosen people they were his precious possession nevertheless they had disobeyed him they turned to other gods and they'd made a terrible mess of everything. But the prophets spoke of a coming Messiah, a coming king. And so everything rested on this king coming to lift Israel out of the mud and the muck and the mire and to make something of them. And so in the fullness of time, as the scripture says, the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And here is a statement made by this old man, Simeon, as he took the baby Jesus in his arms. And this is what he said. Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. God had promised him that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah, the King of Israel. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, so he's saying that Jesus has come not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well, and the glory of your people, Israel. Now, here is a point that we mustn't miss in the life of Jesus, because he followed the same route as Israel. And it's recorded in the gospel specifically so that we can see the similarity between the Lord Jesus and the nation of Israel because he'd come to establish the kingdom of God and it had to have an Israel shape about it. He'd come to introduce his new world order and choose his office bearers and prepare them to rule and reign with him in due course when the kingdom is established upon the earth. So notice the similarity. It says, So Joseph got up, took the child Jesus and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Here is the fulfillment of Hosea's prophecy. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now, this is very significant because God called the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And that story occupies a great part of the Old Testament, particularly the five books of Moses, to tell us how God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. The Exodus is a very, very important story because here we are being told that Jesus, the Messiah, had come to 
bring about a new exodus to take people out of the slavery of sin and lead them into a new kingdom and into a new age. And that's really what Jesus is doing. And here we see the similarity as the scripture records these things for us. So here is further confirmation from scripture that Jesus is leading the new exodus, leading us out of slavery into a new era, a new age, not out of earth and into heaven, but rather out of this age, this present wicked generation, this present wicked age, into the new creation that God is planning. That's God's grand plan. So here is the new Moses, the new Moses to lead the new exodus out of slavery. And going back to the story of Moses back in the Old Testament, it says the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew woman in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. Now, a very similar thing happened, as we know. When Herod realized, this is in the time of Jesus, that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, those were the wise men that came from the east, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So the very same thing. So in Moses' time, all the boys were being killed to try and stamp out the possibility of a leader rising. Here is Herod doing the very same thing killing all the little boys to try and stamp out the possibility of a king rising out of them. And then we're told, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. That's in Hebrews. He, it goes on to say, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So we're being invited into this group of people that will be led by Jesus in the exodus, out of slavery, into the glorious light of the saints of God. Here are some further similarities between Jesus and Israel. Um, like Israel, who spent 40 years in the wilderness to be tried and tested. God kept them in the wilderness because they were being tempted and they were being tested. And of course, they failed that temptation. But Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. Now, thank God. God, the Lord Jesus, never failed like Adam and Eve failed and like um, Israel failed because he was tempted to eat something contrary to his father's instructions, just like Adam and Eve when the devil said, turn these stones into bread. Um, and he was very hungry at that time, but he knew that God had said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the whole temptation in the wilderness was trying to tempt Jesus to go independent, to, to do it his own way. And he, being God, of course, had the ability to do it, but he did not yield to that temptation. He was also tempted to put God to the test when he was taken up onto the pinnacle of the temple to test whether God had really said he would look after him. And then he was offered dominion over all the nations of the world, subject to giving glory and worship to Satan. So the dominion that Adam and Eve had, here the devil was offering it back to Jesus, but the condition was he was to turn his attention and worship the devil and give him glory as if he was God, which of course Jesus refused to do. He said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. As soon as Jesus came out of the wilderness, he then told everyone to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he went about straight away to choose out 
12 men, just like there had been 12 tribes of Israel. I've said this. Jesus then chose 12 disciples, just as God had chosen 12 sons of Jacob to form the 12 tribes of Israel. So these 12 men he chose, and just like God had chosen Israel because they were few in number, they were not the most numerous, nor were they the easiest people to work with. So likewise, Jesus chooses out 12 men who would form his government, his administration, to rule in his kingdom. So let's consider these men that Jesus chose. In Matthew chapter 10, we are given the names of the people. There was Simon, who Jesus changed his name to Peter. His day job was that he was a fisherman. So he knew nothing about ruling nations. He knew nothing about administration or the kingdom of God. He was just a fisherman, but Jesus chose him. Andrew, his brother, similar. He, his day job was a fisherman, and he likewise was chosen by Jesus. James, the son of Zebedee, also a fisherman, and his brother John, Jesus called these two men the sons of thunder. They obviously had quite a temper. Uh, Philip, we don't know what his day job was, uh, so we don't know too much about him. Likewise, Bartholomew, we don't know much about him. Thomas, we know, was skeptical and always, it seems, wanted proof of, um, he didn't just take for granted what was told him and reported to him. He wanted to see it with his own eyes. Matthew, now, this man, his day job was he was a Roman puppet and a tax collector. And the Jews hated the tax collectors because they were always siding with the Romans. The Romans told them to collect taxes from the Jews and pay them over to the Romans. But of course, these tax collectors used to double and even sometimes quadruple the amount and keep half of it for themselves and pay the rest over to Rome. James, the son of Alphaeus, we don't know what his day job was. And same with Thaddeus. Um, Simon the Zealot, he was a revolutionary and he was determined to physically liberate the children of Israel from Roman oppression. So he was, he was aggressive and he was militant. Um, and then Judas Iscariot, who betrayed the Lord. So he was a thief, but he was later replaced by Matthias in Acts chapter 1. So these were the 12 people that Jesus chose to train up to be the governing men over the whole world. Now that, that tells you something, that he was not choosing the best soccer team. He was actually choosing probably the worst soccer team, but he didn't want them to depend upon themselves, but learn to depend upon him. Now that speaks volumes to us, and that's very important. This principle we need to grasp. It's always very interesting to get to the end of the book and to see how it all works out. And here we get a glimpse of the new world order, which is the new Jerusalem, the holy city that comes down out of heaven and it, it takes up its position upon the earth. Now, what we're told about the city is that it had a great and high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So here is this very unlikely nation, stiff-necked, stubborn, hard-hearted, who failed God time and time again, but nevertheless rescued, delivered, and have been brought out of slavery into this glorious and wonderful position where they play a vital role as the ruling nation of the world under the direction of their Messiah, the Lord Jesus. But not only that, here are the officers and the administration that Jesus had been preparing during his earthly ministry. Because this is what he says to his 12 disciples. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things in the new creation, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Not judging in the sense of, of right and wrong and sending them to jail, etc., but rather ruling. They, they'll have authority and dominion to rule. They are the officers to rule over the nation, and the nation is the ruling nation that God is using as his vehicle to rule over the world. And this is what we find. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles 
of the Lamb. And here we find this team of most unlikely men from different backgrounds and obviously quite a difficult mix. But Jesus had trained them, had ministered to them, had given to them the Holy Spirit, had opened their eyes to understand the scriptures and equipped them sufficiently for them to play this vital role in the New Jerusalem as the administrators of the nation of Israel. Now, this is very important because we need to see what Paul has to say to us so that we can also be part of this great administration. We've been called into the kingdom of God to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is important to note is that these 12 apostles were sent into all the world to bring the gospel of the kingdom to us so that we too can be called into fellowship with the Father and with the Son and be part of this ruling administration to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, to be co-heirs with him. So just like God's choosing of Israel and just like Jesus choosing those disciples, the unlikely team, so likewise Paul says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So that is the principle behind it all. God does not want pride to defile us and to destroy us because pride comes before a fall. And God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So he has called us. So even if we thought we were noble or thought that we were influential in any way, we need to put that aside. Like Paul said, he could lay claim to being a Hebrew of the Hebrews and all the qualifications that he had. But he counted those things but done so that he may just know the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's so important that our full dependency is upon the Lord. And that's what Paul is telling us here. So here's the point I believe we need to get. If we read from Acts through to Jude, all the letters of the New Testament, written by Paul, Peter, James, John and Jude, these give us the doctrine and the truth to bring us into the kingdom of God and bring us into a relationship with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can begin to understand the kingdom of God. And so the teaching of the Lord Jesus in the Gospels becomes vital to us to help us to understand what the kingdom of God is like. It is unlike the kingdoms of this world. It is quite different. In fact, it is in many ways opposite. We also need to read the whole of the Old Testament to understand how not to do things and how not to go independent, but rather be like King David, who constantly inquired of the Lord. And that's why he was a man after God's own heart. He constantly put the Lord first. And these are the lessons that we're needing to learn. So finally then, one of the trainee administrators of the world under the tutorship of Jesus while he was on earth, Peter, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he makes this invitation and he was quoting the prophet Amos. He said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So by responding to the gospel, that's an invitation for us to come on board. But what are we really signing up for? So what I've said here is we need to join the new Exodus. Jesus is the new Moses. He's leading a group of people. He is building his church and he's leading us out of this present age and into the age to come. So let's look at the parallel. Because the children of Israel back in Egypt were told to put blood on the lintels of their doors and the angel of death would then pass over them. We similarly put blood upon our hearts in the sense that the blood of Jesus has been shed on our behalf. And so by faith, we're applying it to our hearts and lives by repenting of our sin, believing that Jesus died for us and then believing that his blood gives us access to the very presence of God and therefore will give us new life in the creation, the new creation that is to come. 
But then the children of Israel pass through the Red Sea and we do something similar. We need to be baptized in water. By being baptized in water, we are saying goodbye to Egypt, goodbye to the old life, setting it aside, being buried with Christ by faith, and then rising to walk in newness of life, even though we're still in this present age, but we're rising to walk as if we are those that are being prepared and trained to enter into the new creation, the new age to come. So water baptism is not symbolic. The water is symbolic, but the action is an action of faith that is required by us. That is our signing on to be part of the new government. Then you will receive a deposit of the Holy Spirit to lead you through the wilderness, because that's what the children of Israel found themselves in the wilderness. And the Holy Spirit will equip you to withstand temptation. Just like Jesus went into the wilderness, we have to take a similar route to be tempted and tested and tried, that our faith may stand, that we might be sure of our convictions. And then we need to, like the children of Israel, collect the living manna every day. They went out and collected manna every single day except the Sabbath. And Jesus said that he is actually the living manna. And we need to feast upon the Lord Jesus, which really means his word. Feast upon his word and let it sustain us and strengthen us. Because Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Then we need to... Find righteousness, peace and joy in the kingdom of God through the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul tells us in the book of Romans. So while we're living in the turmoil of this world, we can nevertheless know a deep and wonderful peace, the righteousness of God, and also the joy of the kingdom of God, the joy of the hope that is set before us. And we can rejoice even in the midst of of sorrow and turmoil and darkness all around us. Then we need to learn in this wilderness to overcome the lusts of the body. Paul says, I keep my body under, lest having preached to others, I myself would be a castaway. We need to bring every thought into captivity. So take control and overcome the vain imaginations of the mind. The mind is so active and explosive and these thoughts rush into our mind we need to take control of those things and control the tongue as James tells us in James chapter 3 a very important exercise then confirm your allegiance to Jesus and the new covenant by breaking bread regularly Jesus said we must eat of the bread and drink of the cup in remembrance of him and then become a servant to your fellow man or woman, especially to those of the household of faith, even when you don't agree with their interpretations of Scripture. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by your love one for another. That is sadly lacking in the world today and in the church today. And we need to, by the grace of God, uh, rise to the occasion because as we view all of these things, which I'm sure, as I said, we're familiar with, But let's see them in the light of our training to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. This is what is equipping us and preparing us to be part of his government. Let's now give the final word to the King of Kings himself as he addresses us in the last letter that he wrote to the churches. This is what he said. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now that obviously doesn't mean the throne will be crowded, but what it does mean is that he's offering to us the opportunity to to share with him the authority that comes from that throne to rule and reign with Jesus Christ over the world. That is the exciting and glorious invitation that he's offering to us, but we need to overcome. So the Christian walk and the, the training ground that we're in is learning to overcome by the grace of God. And then Jesus tells us this in Matthew. He says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So there's a need for us to learn to endure. This is developing us. It's shaping our character and preparing us to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. 
And he says, and this gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom is coming, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And that will be the beginning of the new world order, the new creation, and the new age that God has promised to us in his word. God bless you, and Maranatha.